Thank you for having me tonight. I'm thrilled to be presenting to your chapter and we hope to, Brent and I have been talking about organizing a Calflora South Coast CNPS hike or plant excursion in the spring. Um, so if that's interesting to you, it would be great to meet you in person. Zoom is, as we also were talking about, very easy and accessible and, you know, but there's nothing like meeting people in person if it's possible. This is a lot of you, I don't know actually, most of you who are in this chapter that you're in the chapter. So I'm, I'm sure I'm missing some people who have amazing photos in Calflora. Um, who, so sorry in advance, but here's just a few to go over while, while I'm introducing myself and saying hello. So here's one, Stinging Nettle by Brent. And the reason why this photo is so great, well, you all probably know this already, but when you have a diagnostic, a photo that helps people actually ID the plant, like this one does showing the backside of the leaf and the veins and the shape of the leaves of the stinging nettle, that's um, what we, well, we have a team of volunteers. And if you'd like to join this team, you're welcome to. I put the support SPPRT at calflora.org email in chat. So within Calflora, you can put your photos and sometimes you're cho are there are chosen to be reference photos as Neil's and Brent's and Anne's. So this is a really nice primrose photo from Ann Dalkey, BJ Diane. I'm not sure if BJ is in your... Um, chapter or not. But anyway, that's just a, a few examples. Yes, we do have introduced plant species in Calflora also, not just native plants. So my outline for tonight is to go over the Calflora basics. Some of you are very familiar with Calflora and add your photos to Calflora. And some of you maybe are hearing about Calflora for the first time. So I'm going to go over some basics. Talk about the planting guide. It's fall, it's planting season. You might have a garden that you're planting or a restoration area that you're planting. And Calflora pulls from millions, I think we're over 3 million observations now to inform the planting guide. iNaturalist, we have a lot of data sources, including iNaturalist, um, where the Calflora data come from. I'm going to talk about that. And then at the end, your questions. And if you have a burning question as I'm talking about something that you need answered, just please write it in the chat so that um, I think Brent and somebody will be monitoring the chat and can interrupt me and just, if it's something that you need to know right that second. Well, that got cut off a little bit. The Calflora team is what that's supposed to say. Here we are, there's seven of us and we have as a database, as a website, we have a lot of developers, people doing the backend coding, um, development director in charge of fundraising. Well, I guess ultimately I'm in charge of all this fundraising, but she's a great help with that. Pete Fry is our weed manager director. So we have a whole arm or whole branch of Calflora dedicated to a software called Weed Manager to help um, land managing agencies with tracking their invasive plants and any treatments, bookkeeper, anyway. And I, you might have missed this when I was talking with Brent. My MS is in GIS. So I'm really good with databases, really good with maps, data science. Um, I've learned a lot since I have joined the Calflora team in terms of botany, but I'm not a botanist by training. So I just want to put the little disclaimer out there because um, when I mispronounce things, um, that's why. So what exactly is Calflora? We are a 501c3 nonprofit and a wild plant database. People always say, why do you have to have invasive plants? Why can't you just have the pretty native plants? And it's like, well, we all wild plants. And if we only had native plants, then we would have only native plants. But there are also introduced ones that are wild. How many? Oh, I should have asked you this before I gave you the answer. Right there it is. How many native and introduced plant species are there in the state? About 8,500. All of them are in Calflora. Oh, we're up to three and a half million now. Okay, I thought we were at like 3.1 or 3.2. Apparently we're at three and a half million plant location observations. So every time you put something into Calflora, it needs to have a location associated with it. Um, and 
We have data feeds from lots of sources, including specimens coming from the California Consortium of Herbaria, and I naturalist I mentioned before, plus EDD maps, plus county parks, plus state parks, plus national parks. You know, they all feed into the CalFlora database, and that makes about three and a half million plant location observations. Oh, yes. Well, as we know, it's really hard to keep track of plant names. I'm still, I know there are maybe two mimulus left in, in California or maybe three, uh, but everything else is either Diplicus or Erythranthi. And that's a hard change for me to get through my head. So if you're, even if you're looking up a mimulus and it has a new name, you'll find it in Calflora. We do, the verb we use is crosswalk. So if you're, um, we crosswalk old and new plant names and old, old, old names, because sometimes they change multiple. There's like eight, nine name changes. That's a lot. So we crosswalk them so you can find the plant you're looking for. 300,000 plant photos. So don't be shy. Your photos are welcome and it won't be too much. We can handle gazillions of photos and about 80,000 unique e-visitors each month. We can track that via IP address, about 2,600 a day. So all wild plant species are in the state, 8,500. I've been trying, what's your, maybe type in the chat, what is your favorite word or maybe a couple words to describe what CalFlora does in terms of bringing data together from lots of different sources? I sometimes use the word aggregate, compile, assemble, collate, gather, collect. Maybe you can think of a better way to phrase it. Aggregate, I think, confuses some people. Compile, um, I don't think everyone knows what it means. Assemble, people think, oh, that's like you assemble a car or something. Collate, maybe, is that too confusing? I don't know, what do you think speaks to you in terms of lots of sources pulling them all together. And that's what our developers spend, I don't wanna say most of their time, but a lot of their time doing is bringing these data sets into CalFlora so it's up to date, it's current. I'm just gonna check the chat here. Visualize, interesting. Represents density, gather. Okay. I wonder, Brent, after this meeting, could you send me the chat? I think you're able to do that. Sure. That would be helpful. And then I can look over what people have said about word choice here. Ooh, that's a lot of text. You don't need to read all this. This is just a list of some of the sources, not even all, um, from where, from whom, from which we pull plant data. Mount Tamalpais State Park, Nevada County Agriculture Department. Observer, observations contributed online, like Neil, Brent, Anne, and BJ. Those all came from, um, um, just, you know, went to California and contributed some photos. Presidio Natural Resources, Santa Cruz State Park, Sonoma Ecology Center, on and on and on. Um, this is a snippet of the places where our data come, the California data come from. As important as what CalFlora is, it's also important to say what CalFlora is not because our name can be confusing. We have that Cal at the beginning. So people think, oh, you're part of UC, you're part of Cal, but we're not. And then they think, oh, you're part of CalPhotos because CalFlora and CalPhotos, that's very similar, but we're not. Oh, you're part of Calypsi, that's the California Invasive Plant Council. We're not, we're not part of CNPS, as you all probably know. And we're also not part of CalScape. CalScape is part of CNPS. So we've been our own 501c3 nonprofit since the year 2000. Where does the funding come from? As a director, that's important for me to be tracking. About a third is fee-for-service work. Someone will say, I need this to be built, and we build it. About a third is weed manager. I mentioned our invasive plant um, software system. And about a third comes from donations, private, um, from different groups. Some CNPS chapters are part of our, our donate as a chapter. Um, and the fall fundraiser ends not today. It just ended recently, but you know, donations are always welcome. Okay, so this is what we have as a 
tax, we call these tax on report pages. You could think of that as a plant profile. Um, I kind of want a show of hands. I know you, you can show your hand on Zoom by, I think, you know, you can click and like put your little hand up. So put your little hand up if you've ever seen, or I guess if your video is on, you could just wave. If you've ever seen a Calflora taxon report page, such as this one. One, two raised hands, three. That's not as many as I thought, four. Seven, and some of you are waving, so we'll say about a third. That's it. Okay. Well, I'm gonna go into a little more detail because that's not very many, not very many people, out of a group of thirty some. So, each of the eighty five hundred plants in the that are wild in California have their and subspecies and varieties each have their own pages too. So they have a page like this with a scientific name the author or authors, common name or common names, and then this brief description, is it a shrub? Is it native, is it not native? And then some links to, we have a pest and pathogen um, database that we build, Cal Invasives that shows um, if there's a pest or a pathogen that's associated with that species, you can look at the distribution across the state, like Sudden Oak Death, Phytophthora, also, we have the bloom wheel, where you can see the turquoise colors showing when it blooms. Photos, lots and lots of photos. And those four photos I showed at the beginning from your chapter members, those are the best photos that our volunteers choose to put on this page. And if you'd like to be someone who gets to decide that, we can give you special access to decide what order these photos should be in and which photos should be shown. And it's a, it's a living, you know, it's like never done. It's not static. It's always, you know, there's always a better photo. There's always something that could be updated. So it's kind of with 8,500 different pages, we need a lot of people working on that. And we have um, the family and the genus, of course, and then below the fold, lots more information about each species. I mentioned the name changes with the mimulus and how that's really thrown me off. Um, here's the erythranthrum microphylla. Alternate names. One, two, three, four, five. We call it alternate names instead of synonyms because it's not always a one-to-one -one relationship. Although in this case, yeah, in this case, it might not have been a one-to-one -one relationship either. Um, that means that one-to-one -one means that all of the Mimulus gutatus variety, the pauperatus, became Mimulus gliriosus. And I'm not actually sure if that's true. And then all of the Mimulus gliriosus became Erythranthi microphylla. That would be one-to-one-to-one. -to -one -to -one. Sometimes there's lumping, sometimes there's splitting. And the, you know, as you know, the nomenclature and it's always being updated. Kier Morse just released his Malacothamnus treatment. We're getting that into Calflora. We're not the name authority. We rely on Jepson for that. We rely on CNPS for that. If Jepson and CNPS disagree, then we <laughs> then we have to choose one. Um, so we just want to reflect what other people who are the name authorities, nomenclature authorities have decided, and that's what we do. And whatever name you're looking up, even if you're looking up Mimulus, Langs, Dorfii, Variety, and Cygnus, which you know might have been from the 50s, or we could check Cal Florence and see when it was from, um, you'll still find Erythranthi microphylla. We also do not alter data. So if you entered, if you took a photo from you know whatever year, added it to Calflora with a Mimulus name, and now that Mimulus has become Erythranthi. We crosswalk it so it shows up in the Erythranthi page with all the Erythranthi um, observations, but we're not going to change your original data. That's that stays the way it is um, for historical and data integrity reasons. We also include nursery and seed sources for native plants. So this verbena 
gorgeous photo by Adam Chasey um, can be found at the following nurseries. And then there's a link to them. So it's all I'm going to, and I'm going to go over this live on the CalFlora website after I'm done with my static um, PDF here. Okay, that was the CalFlora basics. So uh, next comes the planting guide and then iNaturalist and then your questions. Well, your questions, your urgent questions also as we go. So first of all, for the planting guide, we're gonna go to the CalFlora homepage. And on the left side, we have all these links to get quick links to get places quickly. So we'll click there. And let's just first, what is this planting guide? Talk about it for a minute. How does it work? You put in a location where you wanna plant and it gives you a list of all the native plants that would grow well there. And the CalFlora algorithm, that's a fancy way of saying um, computer program, matches the plant tolerances with the location values of the following factors. Okay, let's, let's, I'll get into the factors in a minute. Let's just screen share first the planting guide. So do you see Chrome now with David Berman's photo? Yes, yes no. we do. Yes, okay, good. So I'm gonna click on here, this is CalFlora to go to the home page. Actually, I'm gonna get rid of a couple of these tabs. All right. Now here are quick links. If you're signed in in the upper right, like I am, oh, I have a notification. So that means somebody commented on one of my records and I need to pay attention to that, which I won't do right now. Um, well, you know, I could, but I, that's not the focus of today. And as I mentioned before, I'm trying to be succinct and I'm trying to focus on one thing at a time and not be overwhelming. So with that goal in mind, let's go to the planting guide. Here is the link to the planting guide. Now, I am not familiar with your chapter, so let's, or your chapter region. So under, on top of every map, we have something called layers. And if you open up layers and then region, you can turn on your CNPS chapter region. You can turn on protected areas. That's actually one of my favorites. Um, Jetson regions, you can turn on eco regions, watershed. That's another really good one. There's all the watersheds. So you can search for plants within a certain watershed or within a certain Jetson region. Um, but anyways, for now, let's go to your CNPS chapter. And when I click on it, it'll pop up down here, South Coast. And where in your chapter area shall we say that this garden is that we want to get a list of native plants that will grow well there? Let's put one in Carson. Carson. Okay, northeast, south, oh, here, Carson. Here, right here? Is that Carson? Or was that what you had in mind? Yep, that's what I had in mind. So okay. Adele, Adela is asking if you can make that map part bigger. Yeah. She's having trouble seeing on her screen. There we go. So Carson. It's funny, there's that one white block. I'm not sure what that's about. It's a little bit weird. So we're going to... Put our cursor in Carson, or just put it north of Carson. And is this area low water? Uh, yes. So it's not riparian, right? There, so, well, there, you can see that there's there a, is this. like the LA River or Dominguez Channel. Yeah. So should we move our point closer to the LA River and call it yeah, riparian or let's, let's leave it where to, it is? Let's go to the region near that, that uh, water feature which is um, a lot of concrete now, but maybe there's a possibility we could restore it. <laughs> I've heard that the LA River, they're working hard on restoring it. Get the news up here about it. And people kayaking, swimming. swimming oh, is a bit if of only that could happen instantaneously. <laughs> okay, so like this close or farther away? Yeah, or... That's, that's good, yeah, adjacent to it. Okay, so we'll say riparian. Do you think this is shady or not shady? No, uh, it's probably not very shady right now. Okay, and then there's more criteria, but let's let's just see what we get with the criteria that we have. 57 plants, 
I'm going to fold up the map now that you've seen where it is. We can always fold it back down again. This little blue arrow here folds the map up and down. And just to get it out of the way, I like to fold it up so I can see the results better. I'm going to uncheck group by life form. Now let's just scroll through these and we can change our criteria if we want. We have attracts pollinators with the little butterfly. We have some photos, the bloom wheel. Um, 57 is actually a pretty good number, I think, for a garden. You can look and see where they're from. So let's just pick, if we want to get this epilobium, epilobium if you want to know where you can buy it, well, first of all, you can go to the taxon report page. You can see here are the subspecies and varieties. Here's some more nice photos. And if you wanted to change these photos around and put yours at the top or somebody else's at the top, you could be a, a volunteer reference photo editor and do that. Um, the fact that these spill over into Nevada and other states is intentional. Some people have asked, do you, do you have a mistake or something? But that's intentional. Um, wetlands, communities, and so forth. So that's about this, this willow herb. Let's go back to the planting guide results. We have the, we just looked at the taxon report. Now let's look at CNPLX. That is a mouthful that stands for California Native Plant Link Exchange. Oh, it looks like there's only two places that I can't believe that. That is, it's got to be sold more than just in Livermore and Carpentry. That can't be right. Let's check another one. Um, scroll down, looking through these photos again. It's alkaline. All right, so we can look at the checks on page. Bloom wheel again, photos, alternate names, one, two, three alternate names, a lot of links, different resources, and let's see where you could buy this one. Wow, only three. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised about that. I wonder if our um, data for this for the southern part of the state isn't, isn't as good. Oh, here's Santa Barbara. Okay, so that's the big picture, how the planting guide works. And let's look at the criteria again. Yeah. If and, you've... And, yeah, and I guess ahead. I would say that um, it might have been that those were only grown out for seed for restoration projects. I think okay. I think SNS may contract to do that. So uh -huh. I don't know that that's true, but that's just a guess about why it's not widely available in, right. uh, in the trade. Yeah, and I mean, maybe it was just random that I happened to click on two that weren't didn't seem widely available. So I haven't actually seen that before. Oh, Karen, um, Karen's adding some uh, intelligence in the chat. She says, willow herb grows everywhere. Don't need to buy it. Okay. Oh, okay. Good to know. Thanks, Karen. Let's say that 57 is, is too many, and we want to really narrow it down. We want only plants that are easy to establish. Only plants that grow within 10 miles of this point that we picked right along the river and only in the same county. So I'm tightening, I'm tightening our restrictions down on what we're willing to accept as a potential a plant to put here. And you can also say, well, I already have, you know, a coyote bush or whatever else, and then um, it'll associate plants that grow well with that one. All right, so next to the LA River, tightening the constraints. We probably have about 15, oh yeah, 17 results. So these are easy to establish, grow really, really close by. And why, for instance, if you were wondering why is mule fat on this list, you can look at location suitability. So if you think, ah, I don't think, I mean, obviously I, it does, I'm not suspicious of why this one's on the list. It makes a lot of sense. But if you were just wondering, how did it appear here? Calflora keeps track of the tolerances for every, every plant. This plant, this mule fat, grows up to 2,300 meters and the location value is six, so it's appropriate. It um, needs seven to 63 inches of precipitation. 
location gets 13. Wet season, temperature range, December low, July high. Soil pH is 7.89. Wow, that's pretty precise. If we're given that there isn't any soil next to the river, but <laughs> I'm sure there's some somewhere. And then the pH of this that this plant can tolerate is 5 to 8.9. Um, and salinity, calcium carbonate, available water, et cetera. So that's why it showed up on this list. And um, again, you can go to the tax on report, see in PLX, see where, well, see where it grows, where you can buy it. And if you wanted to share this with someone, let's fold our map back down again. Okay, so I want my friend or you know my partner who I'm sharing this garden with or working on this restoration site with to know about the list. So you can send it as an email, you can download this. This is under tools. And actually if you're not signed in, I don't think you can send it as an email. You might be able to still download it as a spreadsheet. Um, and you can also look at what grows here at this in this ecoregion. So that's the planting guide in a nutshell. And um, I wanted to go back to this list of all, let's see, from current slide. This is the list that the application matches the plant tolerances with the location values of the following 19 factors. Elevation, of course, climate, soil, ecoregion, and county. So if you're wondering how does this thing work, how is it different than CalScape, how is it different from CalScape? CalScape only uses CCH observations. I'm not sure if they're still on one or if they've switched to two yet. Um, and they don't use as many factors as the planting guide does. Um, and the planting guide uses these factors plus um, the three whatever million observations in the database so that you'll probably get different results in CalScape but overlapping in many ways. All right, any questions about the planting guide before I move on? And we can always come back to questions later. All right, iNaturalist. iNaturalist is um, a citizen science database that's worldwide and that um, has I, you know, gajillions, I don't know how many um, observations in the world of not just plants, but everything living. And we harvest or pull some very filtered and very limited data from my naturalist. We don't want all of it. We don't get all of it. We want to filter out what's not accurate. We want to filter out what's cultivated because we're a wild plant database. So we don't include everything. Um, they, so it has to be research grade. And then there's a bunch of art. We have, an, we have an algorithm that every month pulls in observations from INAT. And if you want to make sure your observations from iNaturalist are making it into Calflora, here's how you can do that. Let's go back to the homepage and go to add observations. And this is a list of many different ways you can add observations. Brent, Anne, Neil, and BJ um, used probably either the photo upload or just adding one observation at a time. You can also add a survey. That's something I want to ask you about. All right, a note to myself so I don't forget that. A lot of chapters have checklists or surveys for the region that um, are really useful in Calflora. So as a list saying somewhere in this park, we saw these plants. So that's what a survey or checklist is. And it's great to get those into Calflora and add records from iNaturalist. Let's go here. So type your handle, your INAT handle into the chat and we'll look you up. You do need to make sure that your license is allowing Calflora to pull your stuff. I mean, not right now, but if it doesn't work, it's because your um, license doesn't allow it. Show chat. Oh, I guess I don't see the chat. Did somebody type in a handle you can read out to me, uh, Brent? Sorry. Uh, no, there. Nobody's willing to divulge their uh, iNaturalist handle. Um, <laughs> oh come on! I uh, guess I could do mine. I I, but... I don't I don't happen to have one. I am a 
Cal Flora. Oh, how about Julie Decker uh, says, try her name, just Julie, J-O-L-I-E-D-E-C-K-E-R. Okay. And if, if you don't have an INOT handle, that's fine. You know, if you want to just use Cal Flora, of course, I think that's great. Um, it's just that a lot of people are using iNaturalist these days. And so we want to make sure we're not missing out on good data coming in. And we also want to make sure that we're blocking the bad data, which is a tricky tightrope rope to walk. And, you know, are we succeeding? All right. All right. We, if if uh, Julie Decker doesn't work out, we've got um, a couple more lined up. Okay. Oh, there. Yeah, Thank we're you. flooded with them now. We got, we have four. We're flooded. They <laughs> <I> suddenly <laughs> decided. They suddenly decided it was time. Okay. So, Julie, it looks like I would suspect that um, your Creative Commons license doesn't allow Calflora to have your stuff. So, what's another one, friend? So, here's a lesson to everybody. I guess turn on your California. Uh, your um, Creative Commons license. So we've how about yeah. um, uh, Eco Writer, one word, E C O Writer. That would be Jolene Derage. D. How do you spell the last name? I think D it's e Eco Writer. W oh, uh, R I T E R. Oh, yeah. Right, writer as an oh. as an author of something. Thank you. Oh, that was quick. Okay, next on the list. Uh, how about uh, Marisol Sanchez uh, with an underscore in between Marisol and Sanchez? Uh, it's a capital M if that matters. Don't think it does. Okay, I like that. What? Really? Let's just try oh, it. You guys gotta turn on your Creative uh, Commons licenses. Either right, that or got a couple more. Okay, ready. Uh, Karen Hussman, one word. H-U-S-M-A-N-N. -S 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 Karen. Like that? Uh, two that two ends. M A N N. Okay. Okay, Karen's got. So oh, Karen, first... Karen came through with the gold there. Yeah. It looks like Karen has nine records that are not yet in Calflora. So that either means Karen doesn't have very many observations in iNaturalist or, and or, well, anyway, whatever is not listed here is already in Calflora. Um, and you can see on this map, that looks right to me, so I'm gonna add it to Calflora. But Karen, if you could do this yourself, then they'll end up in your Calflora account rather than mine. So that would be great. This Ariagona is looking good. Oh, yeah, I know. I know that one. So anyway, this is how you can add them to Calflora. And, you know, since they're not my observations, I, you know, I'm a little bit choosy about which ones I put in, but, right. Um, if they're yours and they look legit, go ahead and add them into Calflora and that's great. So that's a bit about iNaturalist. We went over the planting guide. Um, this is the list, oh, I already talked about the list that goes into our, our algorithm for the planting guide. And I did the iNaturalist screen share. So now is time for questions. Well, we had a number of questions in chat about how to change uh, iNaturalist uh, licensing. So I, mm. I I quickly Googled an answer, but uh, it doesn't look like it's comprehensive. It's when you join, you can check it, make a checkbox. Mm -hmm. So it must be something to go back and do that. But mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you, if you happen to know. I think it's, you know, I we ha so we have actually a project um i could look at i could look at the calflora sign on page in iNaturalist but i think yeah just look under profile google it look around you should be able to sort it out yeah uh, so i posted a link in the chat okay for, thank um, you that's that was the first google result i had that looked like it was on target but i i bet you there's a more um there's a higher fidelity answer to do it once you have been in the project for a while mm -hmm. And Karen adds that hers are 
not all wild in quotes. Most are restorations in the Gardena Willows Wetlands Preserve, which is a oh, plant interesting. by naturalist. So how do you mm -hmm. how do you identify a planted plant versus a wild or feral plant? Well, in iNaturalist, there is a um, way to denote cultivated, and then we block all the cultivated ones from entering Calflora. Um, but if, you know, sometimes people don't specify that it's cultivated, and then we don't know, and then sometimes we still get it. So that brings up a good question. What if you see something in Calflora that you think is not accurate, that you think is you know, either the location is, is wrong or the species is wrong. Let's look at this Opuntia. Okay, so after, after we released an email recently about, um, the, actually, okay, let me back up. We release emails about once every 10 days about recent activities, changes in plant names, exciting new finds, um, and this one about Opuntia was about our relationship with CCH, the California Consortium of Herbaria, which is where we get, you know, over a million, I don't know exactly how many observations that are pressed plants. So they're specimens, people collect in the field, submit them to their local herbaria, they're annotated, digitized, and put into CCH, and CalFlora does a data pull from CCH. So anyways, we sent, oh, first, if you would like to receive those emails and you don't, please either put your email in the chat and then Brent's going to send me a copy of the chat later, or you can write sprt at calflora.org. So we sent out this email about our relationship with CCH, and we had a specimen, a picture of a specimen that was a cactus, which is really interesting how they store the cacti because they're big and chunky and you don't want to squish them too much. They put cardboard on top of them and it's a little bit showing that. And this one person wrote in and said, but uh, let's see if I can remember exactly what her question was. Yeah, so this variety, Rachicleta, I'm pretty sure she was saying, maybe it was a different variety. There's this one. Yeah, I think it was this one. Doesn't actually grow in, was it Orange County? And at the time we had observations in Orange County. So what she did was she went in and wrote a comment and said, this observation is not correct. Um, and so then the person whose observation it is receives an email saying, this person thinks it's inaccurate. Are you gonna defend your ID? Or are you going to change it? And that's, you know, your your decision to make as an observer. And um, let's just say in any county search. And so I'm including questionable records in my search, and then they'll show up. And so anything that somebody's commented on becomes a questionable record. And let's see, under the legend here, you can see what all these colors mean. So simple point, purple, obscured. If you're worried about um, someone poaching a rare plant, you can obscure the location. Line or a polygon, it can big, you know, several acres of a species you can create a line or a polygon out of it. Survey or checklist, that's what I want to talk about um, with your chapter. Quad, quad data we get often from the CNPS rare plant inventory. Specimens, those are from CCH, those blue dots. Potential habitat, so if it could live there but doesn't. Zero plants, that's absence data, and questionable. Let's look at one of these questions. All right, record detail. Oh no, I didn't mean to go to that. Uh, to go to comments on capital. Coordinates are not in the stated county Riverside. Okay, so we think that there's a problem with this location because the county that's written on the specimen is San Diego. Okay, stated county Riverside. Huh. 
It says San Diego here. I'm not sure exactly what that means. Maybe, the, oh, the coordinates are in Riverside and the stated county is San Diego. That's what that means. So all these ones with red dots have some issue with them that somebody's commented on, and that's why um, they're questionable. And if the CCH curator or um, person who submitted that, Opuntia, changes it, then we'll get it back in in our next refresh. Now, before I forget, I wanted to ask you about surveys and checklists. Does your chapter have a list? of like plant lists from different places where you go on plant excursions? We do have um, some, uh, you know, a, a flora of the Palos Verdes Peninsula, if that stands in for a checklist. And mm -hmm. there's um, there's a couple versions that are in, you know, more or less ma mature gestational phases. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, if you look online, you can find floras for LA County, which are used typically for um, development. Developers use mm -hmm. them for assessments, but they're not very geographically specific in my uh, experience. Mm -hmm. So there might be somebody who knows more specifically about the answer to that question, but that that's what I know. It, it would be it, it would be brilliant to have a flora of, you know, regionally specific areas within the chapter. Mm -hmm. Well, and you can create those from CalFlora. So assuming your data are complete, like for instance, if we wanted to go to, let's turn on protected areas. Where's this one? So many tabs open. I'm going to start over. Go from the home page. Go to, uh, let's go to observation search and search for observations. Let's go to, what I sometimes do is ask other people to screen share who use CalFlora a lot. I don't like to put people on the spot. I mean, I do, but they don't like to be put on the spot. So let's turn on protected areas. Yeah, you may not find very many in our chapter. Yeah, well, it could be outside, you know, places you, you guys go outside of your chapter area sometimes. So for instance, Arroyo Pescadero, if you wanted to know, um, what grows there, did you, is this, if, does this might ring any bells, Arroyo Pescadero, is that a place you might go? Uh, yeah, it's just across the, the chapter boundary in the Whittier okay. area, I think. Okay. We could do something that's more in your chapter um, area, but I just saw this one. So here's a list of what row, who, what observations have been found in this area. And then we can go to what grows here at Arroyo Pescadera and get a list of all of the species that grow here and print it out and bring it with us next time we go there. Like if we went there in the spring together. Um, 40, so there's 43 observations and 41 plants. So two have been seen more than once. Well, or maybe one, no, two. And um, to print it out, you go to tools, illustrated plant list that's printable. Um, so here it is, and then this you can bring with you. And if you just if you're really just interested in native plants for your trip for your little plant excursion, then you say, okay, what's native? I don't want to see the rest of them. Let's see how many. Twenty seven are native. You go to your illustrated plant list and print it out, and it says your location, Royal Pescadero, criteria native. So here are all the native plants that grow in Royal Pescadero. And the reason I'm asking if you have surveys or checklists is because if you enter them into CalFlora, that makes this list more robust. So maybe, you know, whatever chapter this is actually in, you could check that, has already added their plant list. It doesn't even have to be coming from the chapter where it is. Yeah, it's the real chapter. Yeah, so maybe they've already put it in, or you guys could too, you could have your own, um, and put it in, and that really enhances what's available on CalFlora for other CNPS chapter members, for everybody using CalFlora to say, okay, within this boundary, you don't have to draw the boundary, um, 
you know, you click on the open space and we know that boundary, the database knows that boundary for you already. So you don't have to draw those checker boxes on the national parks and stuff. And just within, somewhere within there, these 27 native plants grow and you can fold up the map again, take a, take a closer look. If you wanna see where exactly they are, you can click on them and display them on the map. So like that. So that's why I was asking if you had plant lists. We have, you can also generate county flora based on cal flora, you, you know, for all the counties in the state. Um, and like you said, that's not very location specific. It's not really, I mean, depending on what you're doing, if you have a development, you know, maybe that is something you need to look at. But I think usually it's better to be a little tighter with the locations. Okay, so let me, let me just stop talking and uh, receive some more questions. Um, all right, so let me back up and chat here. And by the way, if you have a question, you could just break into the conversation here. Oh, yeah. You, Unmute can, throw, yourself. you can throw it in chat, but it's probably much more efficient if you just excuse yourself and ask your question. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I did follow up with uh, a bit more information about how to make iNaturalist a little more permissive. Um, I think if you drill down on the link I provided, then you'll find something that's specific to your situation. Um, and we have a new message in chat. Uh, oh, Wally is asking if there are volunteer opportunities for data scientists at Cal Flora. And I, I happen to think that Wally is perhaps a data scientist. <laughs> Wally, if you could hi. send an what did you say? I just said, uh, hi, uh, I'm, I'm Wally right here, just uh, hi, on my camera. No, oh. nice talk. Thanks, uh, thanks for your presentation. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. Thank you. And um, if you write to sprt at calflora.org, we can send you more information about, you know, we don't have any open positions right now. We do have some volunteer tasks and we're always looking for more help for volunteers. Yeah, just uh, definitely asking about uh, just volunteer tasks. But uh, you said uh, mm -hmm. SPP, SPPRT? Yeah, at calflora.org. You can you. write that chat again too yeah you, could, you should drop it in the chat again for sure um and then um yeah on our on our website tony is reminding uh, everyone that there is a is a vascular plants of the palace Verdes peninsula which we um host a copy of on our website so how does that work if we have a list that's in what an excel format can we just drop that into cal flora somehow yep exactly and i can um there's a we have a YouTube channel with a lot of video tutorials also about how to do exactly that. And I can also help people if they need more than that. Well, that I I never knew that was something we should be doing. And it sounds like we would improve everyone's state of knowledge if we did. So exactly. Uh, in, is in is there somebody what, online that wants to drop vascular plants of the PV Peninsula by David Magny into Cal Flora? It's a real loss if we don't. It's on our website. So uh, I can direct you to it. Don't don't all volunteer at once. <laughs> Come on, people. <laughs> and don't worry about doing something wrong. Like we're here to help you. We can make you make sure it's done and done well. Don't be scared. I have, you know, there's other volunteers outside of your chapter that can potentially help too, but it's better to have somebody in your chapter do it who knows that area themselves, I think. But if really there's a volunteer, we can we can work um, from other volunteers. What about Wally? Maybe that's something Wally I, could help with. I'm not going to speak for Wally, but I, I'll, I'll speak to him. Then. <laughs> yes, well, so, friends, sorry, I, I stepped away momentarily. I, I just heard my name. Uh, what? Uh, what? Uh, yeah, we both, you're already signed up for a bunch of stuff. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Wally, we have. Uh, there's, if you look in chat, there is a, there's an easy target of opportunity. Um, Tony Baker was mentioned that vascular plants of the Palisades Peninsula by David Magny, a well-regarded um, CNPS fellow, I think. Uh, he lives in Ojai right now. Uh, is We host a copy of that on our website because of the local interest, presumably. Apparently, you can just take a list like that and drop it into Cal Flora somehow. And um, I had no idea that that was something that we ought to be doing. So 
Um, yes, I was asking you. for volunteers, and you you seemed like a logical person to volunteer, but you did not speak, so I did not, uh, well, did not yeah. sign you up for it. I'll I'll speak now. Uh, uh, so this this week is pretty uh busy for me, but yeah, well, I'll, I'll uh touch base with you over uh, email. Oh, delightful. Great. Yeah, about about that in a in a few days. So uh yeah, okay, that sounds cool. I'll make a note. And for those. For those of you who weren't jumping up to volunteer, if you want to just quietly explore this option on your own before you say anything, um, one of the, uh, so from the Cal Flora homepage, add observations, one of the ways to add observations is through a checklist entry. And under tools, every page has tools. We have help and then we have these videos. And so that help, you know, just watch the video and you can figure it all out. And if you have questions, you can let us know. Yeah. Hey, I've got a question for you. You've got, you've actually had two apps over the years. I think I've got both of them on my phone. Um, is is that a preferred interface to CalFlora for field work? Uh, that's a great question, Brent. We have, the app is Observer Pro and it's called the same thing on iOS and Android. We released it first on Android in about 2014. And then I think a year later, on iPhone, so maybe that's why you're remembering two, but it's the same thing, it's called Observer Pro. Uh, and if you go into your app store and you um, search for Observer Pro, you might see an astronomy app and then search for Observer Pro CalFlora and then you'll find our app. And it's a great way to add observations and photos to the CalFlora database that of course picks up your location automatically when you're out in the field. If you have a good camera on your phone, you can get those great photos into CalFlora choose them as reference photos. Um, what it does not do at this point, which we will probably be implementing in the near future, is AI help you identify the plants. So for now, you can say, I don't know what it is, or you can select the genus, or you can select the species. Um, but there's no like, let me look at, you know, let me look at these photos and this artificial intelligence will tell you what it is. One advantage to that is that you can use it offline. So if you're out in the field all day and you're on airplane mode, it still works. It still, um, the satellites can still triangulate and get your location even on airplane mode. And so it's, it's a great it's a great app to use. Um, people expect it to be like the INAT app, which has, you know, seek. And so that they can identify plants using the app and we're not that but for taking photos and getting them into the database and then identifying them later, it's a it's a great way. So thanks for asking that question. It's a great question. Um, so what I heard you say is that if I don't know the species, but I didn't know the genus, I can just I can just throw it up there and one of your handy volunteers will uh, do their best to figure out if I've captured the, you know, the species specific identifier that I need to capture to make that, uh, to name it properly? Yes. And there's one more step. Instead of just, you could do that. And we do have a bunch of people looking through millions of observations every day and, you know, making comments and corrections. A even more helpful thing to do would be to go to, um, to put it in a group. So we have a group called Plant ID Help Group. And if you're already in this group, it won't say here, join this group, but because I'm already in it. But if you're not in it, it'll say, do you want to join this group? And you can say yes. And that has about 300 people in it, half of whom are, you know, really great botanists and the other half are really wanting to learn more. And so it's kind of like hel helping each other out. And then you put it into, you can just leave it as it is. It comes into the database as an independent, like not associated with a group. And then you can associate it with plant ID help group. And then those people will, um, that's a more active way to say, please help me. A passive way is to just leave it as unknown or leave it at the genus level and, and cross your fingers. Okay. Uh, so I've, I've just been leaving some at the genus level or refraining from uploading them because I wanted to go back and check on them, but then I never do. Then it never happens. <laughs> I know that feeling. Uh, uh, so Adela is asking, she says, since CalFlora includes native and introduced wild plants, how do you determine if a plant is an invasive species or if it is mm -hmm. grown wild? Mm -hmm. Great question. We don't make that determination. The California Invasive Plant Council makes that determination, but we help people know what the California Invasive Plant Council has decided. So 
Calypsi invasive plants. So I just, let me start from our homepage, go to search for plants. And on search for plants, you can choose all this stuff. You can choose this, you know, okay, let's, actually, let's go to LA County. Sorry, I scrolled down too far. Los Angeles County. So which Calypsi listed species, so weeds, like the more extreme weeds, they have about 300 total on their list. How many of this 300 grow in LA County? We wanna make some guesses? All 300. All three, yeah, maybe. I'll guess maybe 200. Okay, let's see what we get. Oh my gosh. 230. So here they are in alphabetical order. And you can see that they're invasive non-native. So you can also, you know, you can scroll through these and go to the next 50 and scroll through these. Um, if you wanted to see them in plain text without photos, no photos, um, you can also say not native to California. So not specifically Calypsi listed, which is about 300. So in the whole state, there's about 2000, including those 300 that are not native to California. So of those 2000, how many are in Los Angeles County? Go back to photos. What do you guys think? Any guesses for number? Oh, it's gonna be the same ratio. It's gonna be uh, yeah. or something. Yeah, 1500, let's see. Oh, only. Oh, oh, we're doing pretty good. Well, maybe I misremember. Let's look. Let's just get rid of the county query and let's say to let, maybe I misremember two thousand. Maybe it's less than that. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. So all right then. That's that's pretty all right. Although LA County is a smaller county, but um, yeah. So anyway, that's one way to you know kind of explore your county, explore what's native, what's not native, and the question was. What was the question? Something uh, about invasive. Yeah. How do you know if it's an invasive? Okay. It's growing in the wild. So you use Calflora. I don't know necessarily off the bat, but once you look it up, um, and if you don't know what it is, you can also say, I'm pretty sure based on how it was growing right next to the trail and kind of like first, you know, blooming in November and bursting out everywhere it didn't look totally native to me. And then you can look through what does grow in your county that's not native um, and try and figure out what it was. You can also, actually for that scenario, I would go to what grows here, zoom in on where exactly you were and then say what all grows here and then look at, or maybe say um, what's not native to this, you know, open space, and then look at look at that list. So, what is this Angeles National Forest? Let's look at Calypsi listed in our selected area, which is the Angeles National Forest. Shows down here. Search, and then you get a list of everything that's a weed or Cal California Invasive Plant Council listed in the Angeles National Forest. Oh, it's thinking a long time. I guess it's a pretty big national forest. Oh, yeah, it's pretty large. Hmm. Well, while that's thinking, is there another question? Um, there are no more questions in no more questions. The chat. Are there questions on in the from the members? And also, I'm going to, I'm going to, since this query is taking so long, I'm just going to take this URL and paste it into the chat so you all can follow. Oops, was that the whole thing? Yeah. You all can click on that link and do this query yourself. That's a great way to share information in CalFlora just by sharing links. So, you know, I, th I thought of a question. Is there mm -hmm. a way to download a, 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 a curtailed static portion of the database for field work where you don't have a good connection to the, to the web? Yeah, um, you can also put it on your phone. The whole thing? With the locations. So if you're going to a specific place and you want to download locations of either all the plants or specific plants at that location, you can get them onto your phone. Um, you can also create a plant list and put that on your phone. 
So with, you know, you decide what goes on it. Yeah. So does does the does whatever you download, if it's a geolocated plant list, does that have an interface that is supported by I don't know with your Calflora Observer? Yeah, Observer Pro has that interface. Yeah. Oh, it does. So it, you've got you get the data and you get the interface and you just it magically works. Yeah, and I. Yeah, and there's um, YouTube tutorial videos that show exactly how to do that and what it looks like in the end. And there's on Observer Pro, once you have it, I guess I could like hold up my phone and show you guys, but be pretty small. So there's a history tab and you can see whatever you've loaded in. Historical data is anything, you know, that you've loaded into your phone. Um, you can see it on the map. You can see it as a list. You can add assessments. <laughs> I always it's getting so complicated. Okay, I'm just gonna say this thing: create history stack showing change over time. So if you go back and revisit a population that someone else saw, you can associate your observation with theirs, and then you're creating a history stack of how that population has changed. Maybe it's a rare plant and it becomes extirpated, or it's a rare plant being protected and the population is is thriving, or maybe it's an invasive plant you're trying to get rid of. Whatever it is, you can um, see that change happen over time. And using Observer Pro to track those changes in the field is a good way to do it. Okay. So here are the There's so much to learn about this. I, so I've been using Cal4 for years, and there's aspects I haven't even known about. Yeah, it's, I think most people, 90% of the CalFlor users use 10% of the database. And that's, you know, maybe that's fine. Maybe they're getting what they need. But I always wonder if there could be more that they might need. Here's finally our query finished for calypsy listed in the Angeles National Forest. So here's the total number, and then here they are. And you all have that link in the chat if you want to follow up on that and explore it a little bit more. Thank you again for having me, and I look forward to meeting you in the spring when I come down and visit for a plant excursion. And if you have any more questions, just email us at that email that I put into the chat, spprt at calflora.org. And also, if you want to receive emails, I, I write most of them, not all of them, but I think they're really great. Thank you so much. This was great. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the spring. Okay, sounds good. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.